So today we are going to look at the history of iridology <laughs> as an evolving science. And pardon if I pardon me if I cough a little bit. I am just getting over a flu. Um, I, my name is Judith Cobb. I'm a master herbalist, natural nutrition clinical practitioner, certified comprehensive iridologist, and certified comprehensive iridology instructor, certified by IPA. So I'm just going to ask you to play with me in my sandbox for a few minutes. I would love to know if you have any experience with iridology already uh, and what style that is in. That just helps me to tweak my presentation a little on the fly if I know a little bit about who I am with today. We need to understand why iridologists need to know the history of iridology. And this is such an important thing because all good science evolves. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that good science is constantly doing research, is constantly develop its knowledge base, and is constantly letting go of old information that is no longer useful and updating with better information as it's discovered? Does that sound like it's good? Yeah? Well, you know, when we look at this, we need to recognize that there's a lot of iridologists who don't believe that. A lot of iridologists are stuck in the past and are not moving forward. And that's really sad because these iridologists have the best intentions. Often they have really good other training and they are really awesome people, but they are stuck in the past. And that creates a problem because being stuck in the past doesn't allow you to deliver the very best to your clients. We know that iridology is rooted in ancient history. So in, and in ancient cultures of Egypt, India, China, and Greece. You know, when we look at this, um, we need to also then understand that, again, as science evolves, we have to keep pace. None of us were alive when it was commonly believed that the earth was flat. We now know differently. And if we don't believe that, well, maybe it doesn't really affect our lives all that much, but still, we know differently than that now. And even iridology evolves. And so as we continue to look at this, it's important to know what the roots were, where we've come from, and where we're going. So when we look at iridology, we think back to the story that we've all heard of Ignaz von Pechle and the owl. And this is a, a kind of a sad story because it's not really where iridology began. The story goes that Ignaz von Pechle was a little boy. He was about 11 years old. That's the only thing that's consistent among all the versions of the stories I've ever heard. I've heard that um, he either came across an owl or a hawk that had a broken wing or a broken leg, and, or he tried to catch this bird and broke the leg or the wing in the process. I mean, there's so many variables here. And it says that he noticed a line forming and or disappearing in the owl's eye. And so the question is, how did he actually catch a wild bird, especially a bird of prey? How did he actually get that owl to sit still? I don't know. What we do know is that animal eyes have a very different structure from human eyes. Perhaps he did see a line appear and disappear in the owl's eyes. We can't extrapolate this, that the same thing would or should happen in a human eye. What we do know is this has never been replicated. For all of the veterinarians out there, all of the bird sanctuaries that are out there, no one has ever replicated that. And so we have to question whether it was really valid. What is really the most important thing here with this story is not whether or not he saw something in an owl's eye. What is most important is that it spurred him on to do some research. And he wanted to know more. He wanted to know how this all worked. And so he was in the early 1800s in Budapest. And um, we, we need to be aware that 
since it can't be replicated, we can't really rely on it. Ellen Tart Jensen has said this, even August von Petschle recognized years later that Ignatz was looking at an owl's eye and not that of a human, and that he did not have the proper equipment to prove what had been recorded in the stories. It is time for iridology to move forward based on sound research rather than hearsay. And I think that is so, so important. He actually did become a medical doctor he was using a two power magnifying glass and using that and his experiences as a medical doctor, he began to map out the iris, which is pretty amazing stuff when you think about it. He got a little frustrated because he couldn't understand why some people with a particular marking had symptoms while others who had the same marking didn't. Now we actually understand because of the foundation that he laid <coughs> that most of what we see in the iris is inherent. It's not situational, it's inherent. Following Ignaz von Petschle, we have Pastor Nils Lilliquist, who was in Stockholm, Sweden. Now this is where I think it gets really exciting because we have people in different places around the world doing the same research and not knowing that other people are doing the same research and yet they're coming up with the same answers, which I think is just super exciting. Pastor Nils Lilliquist correctly correlated the density of the iris fiber. So for those of you who are on Instagram, I'm going to move my camera closer. The density of the iris fiber to the constitutional strength. And so what we know about that is that the more fibers per square inch we have in an eye, the more resilient the person's constitution is. So that means that person has a higher resistance to disease, a higher, a higher constitutional strength, that they can throw off disease, that they can ward off disease more easily than someone who has a lesser quality of um, in integrity in the fibers. So the image on the left shows us a very high fiber count per square inch. So this is a very dense iris. This is a place where it's really good to be dense, just saying. And this is the fiber structure of an eye of a person who has good inherent resiliency, which is wonderful. The image on the right has a much looser weave, which means less of an inherent resiliency, which means that we are going to have to, as we work with this person on the right, be more vigilant, do more, do more counseling, more nutrition work, more supplement work. Not that we'll ever see those fibers move because they won't. Not that we'll ever see the pigment change because it won't, but because that's what they need in order to enjoy improved health or good health. The challenge with the person on the left is that when we see this dense fiber, these people know from an early age that they've been blessed with a strong body and they often don't take care of it. So they come in to see us and you know they're 45 or 50 years old and they're saying, I don't understand. Now I've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol and arthritis and I've never been sick a day in my life, what's going on? And the answer is, well, you haven't taken care of yourself for a day in your life. So you've earned the right to have this. Ignatz, or sorry, Pastor Neil Sloquist felt that the eyes would change due to toxic exposure and to medications, but we now know that that is not the case. We now know that melanin is the pigment in the eye and it's responsible for the color and the freckles we see in the eyes, and that melanin is what is responsible for all of the color variation. It is not toxic exposure that does that. Pastor Emmanuel Falca, the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, um, also mapped the iris. This is so exciting. And when you look at their individual iris maps, they are so similar. Very exciting. He started laying the foundation for others to build on by defining the constitutions. He also was an iridology instructor. And there is an institute in Germany named the Felke Institute that is named after him because of the wonderful work that he did. Rudolf Schnabel was, again, late 1800s into the 1900s. He was in Cologne, Germany. 
and he researched the pigment and pupil tonus. So we know that the shape of the pupil, the size of the pupil, um, things like that tell us more about a person, about their constitution, about how they're built, about what's going on with their nervous system. He was the first one to actually use a microscope to examine the iris. So that's really cool stuff. Now, of course, ophthalmologists use a slit lamp microscope to examine the eyes every time. And if you've been to an ophthalmologist, you have probably had your eyes examined with a slit lamp microscope. Rudolf Schnabel also said this, it was no easy task and those who believe or would like to believe that handling iridoscopy or iridology can be learned within a few weeks or even days are mistaken and do a disservice to a good cause. So I agree with uh, Rudolf Schnabel on this that you can't learn iridology in a weekend seminar. You can't learn iridology in a 12 hour course. You might learn a little bit, but you're not going to learn enough to be really highly useful. And so, hence the reason I teach my program the way I do. Joseph Ongerer, who was 1900s, and he only died just about 30 years ago, uh, was also in Germany. He was a student of Ongerer's, Joseph, or sorry, Ongerer was a student of himself. That would be interesting, right? He was a student of Schnabel's. He became a naturopath. Now, he was most concerned about the different languages that were used by iridologists. And this is really important because we still have so many different languages used by iridologists. He really wanted to unify the language, come up with one language so that we would call one marking by the same name no matter what. And uh, we still have not achieved that. He knew students were reading books and accepting the printed word about iridology before adequate research was completed because people were printing books that were based on their beliefs as opposed to scientific proof. He personally refused to publish his work until it had been analyzed and reviewed by professional peers. He had a very high integrity for what what he wanted to be leading. Joseph Deck, again the 1900s, he was a dedicated iridology researcher and he pioneered iridology photography. He also was an iridology instructor. You see how this is so strong in Europe, particularly in Germany. We have Theodor Krieger as well, again in the 1900s. He said, I hope that a later generation will succeed in establishing a single uniform system. In spite of zealous efforts, these have so far not succeeded. Now, Krieger was a student of Ongerer, Deck, and Schnabel. So he had three people that he was using for his information that he was studying, which is exciting. He felt that iridology was the number one assessment tool, but that it was best used with other assessment tools like urine analysis, hand analysis, fingernail analysis, tongue and feces analysis. He believed that it was the, the number one, but he believed that we needed other things to show us, to give us more insight. In the more modern day, we have Bernard Jensen, who just passed away in 2001, and we are ever so grateful to Bernard Jensen, because what happened during World War II is all communication uh, was cut off between North America and Europe. And what that meant was that whatever information we had in North America was what we had. <coughs> And it meant that we were not keeping up, could not keep up, sorry, with, with all of the new research that was going on. So while Dr. Jensen did get caught in that stuck mode because that's the information he had, he kept iridology alive in North America. And for that, we owe him a huge debt of gratitude. In 1980, uh, around 1980, Harry Wolf, who was an American, a German-born American, um, 
got his hands on a German copy of some iridology books by Deck and a few others, and he started reading them. He started teaching that. He fell in love with it. It was something he was promoting. And it was just a few years later that Bill Caradonna latched onto it as well. And he and Harry spent a lot of time traveling North America, teaching this new information about iridology. And they are the ones who brought constitutional iridology to North America. It was interesting that just before Jensen's death, he com commended Harry and Bill for the work they had done in progressing iridology in North America. So in North America now, we have really about three styles of iridology being done. We've got Jensenian, we've got rayed or emotional, and we've got constitutional. And as we look at this, it's important to note that, that um, Jensenian is an old school version. Jensenian iridology was originally taught by Bernard Jensen, and it was based on the information that he had at the time. He taught that the iris changes when the body changes, that the fiber structure in the iris would change, that the lacuna shape and size would change, that the colors would change. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have often done iris readings cold with no background information from the client. And this is a lot of what we see online on social media is people posting pictures and other people commenting on them, which I think is highly dangerous. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have a very different style from modern irid Jensenian iridologists. And that is because Ellen Tart Jensen has come around to constitutional iridology and she has carried the torch for the Jensen's in iridology and now she is really promoting the constitutional side of things. Rayet iridology teaches that emotional traits are genetic or inherent and are revealed by markings in the eye rides. Rayed teaches uh, that readings can be done cold and information gathered from the eye rides may be combined with personal and family history information for interpretation. This was founded by Denny Johnson and the work continues to be developed by Jim Virgis and Denny Johnson is still involved with this as well. When we look at constitutional iridology, this originated with Joseph Deck and a few others. It's actually used by medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia. They use iridology as a screening tool to help direct what else they need to do tests on and to help them understand why a patient's body is doing what it's doing. There are correlative medical studies being done uh, with constitutional iridology, which is very, very cool. Constitutional teaches that the eyes are a reflection of a genetic or inherent structure of the body and that it's not, it's not transitional at all. And this constitutional iridology is the foundation of the course I teach, which is dynamic iridology. Constitutional iridology teaches us that iridology does not give us answers. It tells us what questions to ask, and that is so important. And I say that because we can be looking at a client's eyes, and they can have all kinds of markings. But if that client has already figured out the rules their body needs them to live by, they may be very successfully thwarting that inherent predisposition. So we might see that there is a suggestion that their, that their eyes inherently say that they want to have leaky gut syndrome. But this client has maybe learned that gluten is not their friend, that they need to be doing certain herbs and have a certain lifestyle. And they may have completely taken care of that. Now, it doesn't mean that they've gotten rid of the inherent predisposition. It means they are controlling the symptoms. And that's good. That's good. With constitutional iridology, background information is important. We don't do readings cold. We want to have a rapport with the client. We want to understand what's going on. I started learning iridology in 1979. And constitutional iridology had not yet reached Canada. It was also not yet widespread in the U.S. 
I studied and embraced what was available. And that at the time was the Bernard Jensen teachings. I practiced the Jensenian style of iridology for about 10 years, but about halfway into that, I was starting to get frustrated because the things that I had been taught would change in an iris weren't changing. I would give a client a program, a cleanse, a fast, supplements. They would stick to it. We'd work for a year and the eyes would not change one speck. So with that, I was about ready to throw in the towel and just walk away from it. So I would see an eye like the one that's on your screen right now. And uh, Jensenian iridologists call these lesions. Constitutional iridologists call them lacunae. I was taught that every one of these was a pathological problem that was having, happening right now. And that if we did all the right things, these would disappear. We were taught that these lines inside indicated healing. And um, over the years, I proved that that's not true. That's not right. And so when I would ask my clients, do you have an issue in this area, for instance, they would say no. So I was wrong 90% of the time. And, you know, again, we were taught that these were healing lines inside, but they didn't change. Nothing was changing with them. Very frustrated with it all. I was also taught that uneven pigmentation like we see in this body, or in this iris rather, meant that the body was full of toxins and needed to be cleansed, and that then the eyes would turn blue. So we fasted people, we cleansed people, we gave them supplements. Never did I see an eye change color. Sometimes um, when I would go to classes and I would see, or, and teachers would teach about things like lesions being smaller, and, that, and they would say that the eyes were bluer and they kind of looked bluer, but I didn't know anything about photography back then or photographic technology. And my frustration was growing because what my teachers were saying was true wasn't working in my practice at all. Then I learned about constitutional iridology and decided to give it a chance. What I, what I actually did was I uh, was blessed to cross paths with, um, with the organization that Bill and Bill uh, Cardona and Harry Wolf had created. And I wrote away to them and they sent me back a brochure and they had VHS videotapes. Okay, I've just dated myself right there, right? <laughs> And so I ordered their videotapes and I studied those videotapes. I studied them. I must have gone through them each 10 or 20 times. And so a two hour video would take me 20 hours to go through because I would watch it. I would study it. I would make notes. I would pause it. Really studied those. And what I learned was that these inherent predispositions are passed down for three to four generations. I learned that pigments are not an accumulation of toxins. I've learned that the pigments show us inherent predispositions to organs that are more prone to being out of balance and that um, are prone to putting stress on other organs as well. We can't cleanse out pigment. Constitutional iridology teaches us to look for patterns and to understand the interrelationship of organs. It teaches us that if a person is already doing things that are supporting good health, there may be no symptoms, but the eyes aren't going to change because that hasn't changed their inherent predispositions. Constitutional iridology teaches us to look at the eye in the context of the owner. And that is so important. For example, this is the eye of an Asian woman who's in her mid-30s. Her concern when she came to me was infertility. The fertility clinic had been unable to help her and her husband. And actually, they kind of just threw in the towel and, and really were no use whatsoever. One thing I noted was that she had contraction for us. That's pretty obvious, right? If you're a Jensenian, you're going to call these nerve rings. And... Um, so I, when I, um, I added that to the other indicators that I saw in her eyes, and I suspected she might have problems methylating her B vitamins. And that includes folic acid. And 
when a woman is trying to get pregnant, she has to be able to methylate her B vitamins because if she doesn't, her fertility will suffer. So I suspected also that, um, that she, well, she has a little bit of a lipemic diathesis. So I suspected she had a little bit of a problem uh, processing her carbs properly in her body, which then made me ask the question because she hadn't volunteered this information of, did she crave sweets? And she said, yes. And I said, have you ever, has the doctor ever mentioned anything about being type two diabetic? And she said, oh yeah, they've told me I'm type two diabetic. All right. Well, when we put type two diabetes together with the likelihood that she does not methylate her bees, we've got a perfect recipe for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now I've worked with many cases of PCOS and they have very different eyes. Every one of them has different eyes, but because I understand what indicators to look for and what questions to ask, I can get to the root of this. Now, I could not have arrived at any of these insights with old style iridology, none. Constitutional iridology is exactly what informed my analysis and program development for this client. Approaching her health from that angle uh, with dietary corrections lifestyle corrections and appropriate supplementation, she was able to conceive and she delivered a very healthy baby boy in a three hour labor and delivery. Everybody was quite impressed with her on that one. So what do, I've skipped a slide there, that's the one I want. What do I think the future of iridology is? I think that as long as there is good research being done and as long as iridology instructors are willing to adopt the new teaching, and as long as they're willing to teach the new knowledge, iridology will gain respect as a valid health assessment tool. If we as an iridology community persist in hanging on to disproved, outdated, and ineffective teachings of the past, iridology will come under fire more fire as quackery. The choice is ours. We need to get and stay current and we need to follow the progress of the science or we need to stay in the past and cripple it. So now I'm registration for this is not open but I'm going to just put it out there that the next go around of, um, of Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology which is an iridology, iridology certification course, will begin April 16th or April 17th. Now I'm offering two different time slots because my, my followers from Australia were saying class times aren't working for us. And so by teaching at 4 p.m. my time on a Friday, it puts it to 8 a.m. Saturday their time. So that's pretty cool stuff. So I read, uh, the registration is not open yet, but if you want to be kept in the loop as to when it does open, hop on over to iridology.education and where it, you get that little pop-up window that says, do you want to opt in for an iridology map? Put your information in there and you'll receive the link to download it. That will also add you to my database. And that means that as when the registration is open, you will receive that notification. This course teaches holistic constitutional iridology. It's designed to help practitioners like you assess your clients quickly and accurately. This course is designed to give you all the curriculum you need to prepare for certification with the International Iridology Practitioners Association. As you can tell, even though my original training 40 years ago was with North American or Jensenian iridology, my practice for the last 30 years has been constitutional iridology. I'd become so frustrated with, with how North American iridology didn't work that learning constitutional was exactly what I needed to do. And so with that, again, just a reminder that registration for this program won't be opening till mid-March. The course starts April 16th or April 17th, depending on which time slot works best for you. And if anyone has any questions about whatever we've covered today, I'm happy to answer those. 
And with that, I have, that's everything I've got prepared for you today. Again, if you want to know when the, the registration is opening, just go to iridology.education, opt in for the iris map, and you will be added to my database, which means you will be notified when, reg when reg registration opens. And with that, I look forward to speaking with you again in a few days. Bye for now.